I'm Anne and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to do a pretty challenging video. You see a lot of these videos where booktubers go to the Dollar Tree, get a bunch of books and haul those books. So I wanted to challenge myself by going to three different Dollar Trees and one I did a uh, few months ago, which is my local Dollar Tree, and the other two I have never been to. And I wanted to see the variance of books each of them had, not only over a span of time, you know, three months ago versus now, but also over a span of place, so three different stores. And I wanted to then read them all and see if these books are actually decent. Like I would pick them up and pay maybe not full price, but at least partial price for any of these. So over the last next two weeks, uh, which for you will be the last two weeks, I'm going to be trying to read all these nine books. Also, uh, I have my receipts here and the total of what I spent at each store was $3.23 for three books. So I did that at three different stores. So the total would be $9.69 if I'm doing my math correctly. Today, I'm just going to like introduce you to all the books that I got. And then we are going to jump into clips of me actually reading the books. None of these books authors I actually recognized except for one and we'll get to that one uh, at the end. From what I understand, the reason that the Dollar Tree gets these books is because they're not super popular or the bookstores can't sell them. So they sell them for really cheap to the Dollar Tree to just get them off their shelves. But you know, I think personally, I found some really good books. And I mean, we will see when I read them. I also wanted to get books that were vast variants of genres, but also books that I would probably pick up and enjoy. The first one is The Man Who Invented Christmas by Les Strandeford. This is a fictionalized telling of how Charles Dickens came to write The Christmas Carol. They made a movie of it, as you can probably tell by the cover, these are the actors, and my mother loves that movie. And it also contains The Christmas Carol at the end, even though I already own a copy of The Christmas Carol. And the second one is Silver Stars by Michael Grant. This is about a group of women who fight on the front lines during World War II. The next one is Vanguard by Jack Campbell, and this is a sci-fi as far as I can tell it's about this group that is trying to colonize this planet. The main characters are trying to protect this colony as it forms from being attacked. That's as far as I know what this is about. The next one is Plagueland by Alex Scarrow. So this is pretty much a, as far as I can tell a like zombie apocalypse and it's about this young man who must stay alive during that. That's all I know about this book. The next one is actually a Swedish novel that was translated into English, and that is The Tunnel by Carl Johan Valgren. I don't know how to pronounce Swedish names, I'm sorry. It's like a thriller about this military intelligence officer and high-functioning heroine addict and his wife goes missing or his girlfriend I don't remember and his old friend is murdered so it's kind of like a thriller mystery it is set in Stockholm Sweden the next one is clearly from Target because it has a Target sticker but I found it at the Dollar Tree and that is Fatal Throne the wives of Henry VIII tell all and it's actually not by one singular author. There are 10 authors or something like that. It's pretty much a nonfiction about the stories of the six wives of Henry VIII. This was actually the only copy they had at the Dollar Tree. Usually um, they tend to have multiple copies of each book, but this one I could only find one and I was like, well, it might be better than the others if it's like actually decently popular. The next one is a book that I usually wouldn't pick up and that is American Girls by Alison Uminger. So this book, as far as I know, it's about this teen who uh, runs away from home and goes to California. Her half sister takes her in and then she gets fascinated by like Hollywood as well as like the darker sides of Hollywood. So she gets interested in the Manson murders. I'm assuming it's going to be a coming of age type story. Not sure if I like this because this isn't really the type of book that I would usually get. The next one is another World War II book. But this one is nonfiction. This one is Last Hope 
Island by Lynn Olson. The subtext is Britain occupied Europe and the brotherhood that helped turn the tide of the war. It's definitely denser than the other ones. I'm pretty sure this one is going to take me the longest out of all these books to read. Uh, and then the last one was the one that I was actually surprised they had, and that is Windhaven by George R. R. Martin, Lisa Tuttle. So this is a fantasy graphic novel. This, this art is just beautiful, first of all, and new. This is like $27 is mind boggling to me how this could be in the Dollar Tree. I mean, it's George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones. So I am honestly most curious to read this. Those are the nine books I have to read in the next two weeks, which is a lot of reading for me. So I think I'm gonna actually start with a book that I don't think I'll enjoy to get it over with. I'm gonna start with American Girls because I have a feeling I'm probably out of all of these not going to like this one. I will check back with you when I have made a like big chunk into this book. So See you then. Okay, so quick update. I'm currently halfway through this book. I'm definitely enjoying it more than I thought I would. I went into it with a very low expectations and I will say that I am actually enjoying it for the most part. So the plot follows Anna, who is this 15 year old girl who is living with her mother and her mother's wife. Her mother is a massive narcissist. So Anna decides to run away, um, steal her stepmom's uh, credit card and run away to LA to stay with her sister. For some reason, it didn't really make sense in the book. Uh, the two mothers decide to have Anna stay in LA and get a job until she's like learned her lesson. Her teachers like allow her to graduate or graduate from that grade fine, but her history teacher requires her to write about something. Uh, and the topic is uh, something having to do with the 1950s to the modern day that has changed America and something that has to do with LA. So in the meantime, her sister is working on a project that is based on the Manson murders and the director that is directing her sister says, hey, I'll pay you $10 an hour uh, to read about all these women that were part of the Manson cult and help me understand like why they did what they did. And I really love that aspect of it because Anna's not a really likable protagonist. She's very annoying. She's very um, cruel in many ways, but you can also tell like why she's like that because her mother is a complete narcissist and her stepmother doesn't seem much better. Anna's sister is very caught up in the Hollywood scene. She's beautiful and she's willing to do pretty much anything to get ahead in Hollywood. She is staying on set with her sister's boyfriend for a while. There's these twins, uh, Josh and Jeremy, who are the actors for the main leads on that show, and they're 16, so they're like a year older than her, so she's kind of befriending him. She's kind of developing a crush. I enjoy the elements of her learning about the Manson murders and kind of understanding that and applying it to her own life. Uh, you know, the, the director that hired her to research this pretty much said, yeah, a lot of these girls in Hollywood are Manson girls. And what he means by that is that they don't often have a place in Hollywood where there's these like glamorous, beautiful women. They just fit in with a crowd. And a lot of the Manson girls were like that, where, you know, even though they attributed to these horrific murders, they didn't really stop stop it or speak out against it. I'm actually enjoying this book. I am currently almost 150 pages in and it's about 300 pages. So yeah, halfway done. I think part of the reason I'm enjoying it is because one, the characters are interesting and two, because my expectations were so low going into it. So far, I'm going to put it like at 3.5. I don't know if it's like closer to three or closer to four at this point. We will see. I will check back with you when I have finished the book. See ya. Okay guys, so quick update. I'm well aware that the lighting is probably not the best. I just finished American Girls. Uh, I think I may be giving this a four stars. I really enjoyed this book and I did not go into it with high expectations, which is probably why I enjoyed it more. I'm not going to give full spoilers for the ending because there's 
quite a bit that happens. Everything is kind of weaved together, but the best way I can describe this book is real life in uh, LA. So many topics are discussed. Violence against women, the toxic society in LA. Uh, it even discusses the idea of the homeless issue in LA currently. Variance in wealth between, you know, an average person and like the wealthy elite of LA. Anna, the main character, a little bit gets caught up in that world. Also having that paralleled with Anna researching and becoming almost obsessed with the Manson girls. You know, I wouldn't say that this book is negative, but it definitely handles a lot of negative topics. This is a really good start for this Dollar Tree challenge. And in the end of the book, she returns. I guess this isn't that big of a spoiler because it doesn't give away a lot of things that happen near the end. But in the end, Anna returns to her mother's makeup between her and her sister. They've had some arguments in the middle of the book. So the next one I decided to pick up because I'm just in the mood. I'm gonna go with Playland next because I'm, I'm not actually sure it's about zombies. Infected dive within hours dotting the countryside with haunting skeletons of liquefied victims. So yeah, it doesn't look like it's zombies. It's just like a plague that is crossing the land. And I will get back to you as soon as I'm like 50% in with this one. Okay, hi guys. I am back for a very quick update on plague land. I'm currently halfway through. I am really into it currently. Uh, so the story starts out with Leon. He is 16, almost 17. His mom and his sister and he moved to London recently because they found out that his dad was cheating on his mom. So his mom like separated. The story starts off with this mysterious, uh, plague infection virus coming out of Nigeria and it spreads to a lot of other African countries very, very quickly. Like, um, he hears a notification on the news or something one morning and by like two days they are running for their lives. So it's spread through the air by spores. His mother and sister kind of poo-poo the news reports early on because they're like, oh no, it's it's nothing, you know? And, and then his dad finally calls him and they haven't been taking calls from him because they're all angry at him for cheating on the mom. And he tells him, uh, yeah, you need to go get canned soups, be prepared to go to your grandparents' house that is in Norfolk. And then martial law is declared in America and Britain hasn't even decided what they're gonna do about it or if they're gonna panic or not. They are literally repressing the news. So Leon and his sister and mother, after they learn that America has implemented martial law, they decide to go up to Norfolk to the grandparents. But the problem with that is that the uh, train, the person driving the train stops the train because of an, an obstruction on the track turns out to be a like dead animal. I should probably explain what this disease does to you because pretty much it melts your entire body and you turn into like a globule substance. And it is incredibly quickly. It breaks down bone marrow, um, everything. We also saw something weird with one of the people who died. They talked about later in the chapter, the infection becoming something new. So I don't know if that's going to be something that like comes up later in the book. I think I'm going to do like more full spoilers for this book. The driver is infected, the train is stopped, all trains have been canceled, and several of the cars up front also get infected because they check on the driver. They close off the people from getting into the back carts where Leon and his family are. The next morning they leave, they see the spores in the air, but they're able to like run away from them. Snowflakes almost, they're described. Leon and his family find this bunker that is super stacked with food and the guy who owns the bunker just walks in and he's like, what are you doing? But his name is Muhammad and he says, yeah, there's only three of you. You know, I understand this place is ridiculous. So let's just all stay here together. So they stay there for about a month. And so fla flash forward a month and that's about where I am right now. The things I'm enjoying about the book, it's a really fun, fast paced book. And I especially liked the beginning because it has a lot of like foreshadowing that, yeah, this horrible plague is coming, but people aren't super aware of it. I have a feeling that like most every character would die in this book. 
That's my prediction. Outside of the kind of uniqueness of the virus, but the characters themselves for me aren't that interesting. His mother and sister aren't really that developed. They're developed like base level, but they haven't been developed beyond that, but I am really enjoying it. So I would check back with you when I finish this book. So see you then. Okay, I am back and I currently just finished Plagueland. So the second half of this book takes a different turn. I did predict some of the things that were going to happen. If you remember in the previous clip, I talked about how one of the characters was like reforming DNA and becoming something new. Uh, yeah, that that is played on a lot more in the second half of this book. So the second half, I'm going to give mostly full spoilers of this book. So when last I left this story, there were four people that were together. So they leave to get antibiotics for Grace because she has been wounded. We'll get to that later. And uh, she had had a broken arm before the apocalypse started and Leon was suffering from headaches. So they were both taking medication. So they go to get both of them medication. So they get to the grocery store and they discover that there are like little crab things. So the virus has transformed into animals. It's pretty much rebuilding DNA and reworking evolution at a extremely quick pace. Uh, Leon and Grace escape out of the bathroom, but the mother and the man that they're staying with are ca caught in the grocery store and end up dying. So Flash forward a little bit, uh, Grace and Leon are found by this group of survivors, which the one thing I always hate in apocalypse books is that there has to be so much interpersonal social drama between survivors. It's the one pet peeve I have in every movie book I watch that has to do with an apocalypse. The Walking Dead was notoriously bad for this and I really did not like all the drama. You have this one guy, Dave, uh, who is trying to take over the group for himself and then the real leader, Ron, is trying to hold things together and then you have Freya. Freya is this young woman that Leon befriends and Dave is trying to get into her pants like he tries to assault her at one point. So pretty, pretty bad guy. Uh, but, but I really, really hated the interior drama and that they had to bring this in into this really interesting apocalypse world. So anyway, they, uh, Leon and Grace stay with them for a little bit. And then they notice this unhealthy looking horse outside. They let it in, only discover that the creatures have learned to morph into anything so they can look like horses now. So the infection gets into the building and all these like crabs start crawling and killing people and like the leader Ron is killed and Grace is bitten but then they all stop. All the crabs just leave. All the humans are very suspicious of Grace and Leon because they're like, well, what if, what if they aren't actually humans and they're these creatures in disguise? So Dave, this is pretty horrific. He decides to burn Grace alive. This is a 12 year old girl and Leon and Freya, they're being held back by other people so they can't stop it. So Leon witnesses his little sister brutally murdered. Freya and Leon, then are taken out of the group and are left to survive on their own. At the camp, two survivors show up and Dave is in charge now. And one of the survivors is this girl named Meg and she she's very flirty with him. And then uh, she gets him alone and reveals that she is actually the creature which was inside Grace. As it turns out, people who have been consuming antibiotics and things like Tylenol, aspirin, uh, ibuprofen, they are immune to the infection. Grace was infected, but the creature was dormant because she was still consuming these antibiotics. So when the crab creatures bit her, they recognized, oh, inside her is actually already the creature that is, you know, growing. After Dave burns her, that creature then reforms into a new human. At the very end of the book, it says that Grace is actually now a guest host in this body or entity. And she's not dead. She's just being remade. So 
As it turns out, this is supposed to be the first book of a series. Here's the things I really liked in the book. The apocalypse was really fascinating. As it developed, especially in the second half of the book, it was really fascinating how it morphed into something more, something more complex. So I really enjoyed how the apocalypse was formed. The characters were just average. I enjoyed Leon. I liked Grace, but I won't say they were exceptional characters. Outside of Leon, I didn't feel like anybody had a very complex character. They were all very basic characters that never like broke out of their like basic characters. I really disliked the second half area where we were focusing on the group dynamic power struggles. I really don't like that in poc apocalyptic novels. I think I will give this book three out of five stars. I won't say it's the best novel I read, but it was enjoyable. The next book I've decided to read, because I'm pretty sure it's not going to take me that long, uh, is Fatal Throne, The Wives of Henry VIII. I will check back with you either when I'm halfway done with this or when I finish it. So see you then. Okay, I am indeed back. I decided to just finish fatal throne. I read the entirety of it. Where do I start with this book? I, I didn't have that many thoughts about it reading it and that's why I didn't do a halfway update. It's written from the first person perspective of all these different queens. So the first section is about Catherine of Aragorn, the second one is Anne Boleyn, third one is Jane Seymour, etc, etc. And in between each of the sections about their relationships with Henry VIII, there is this short, I guess, intermission where we hear from Henry VIII himself. I, I liked that idea because it feels much more intimate when you write in first person as opposed to third person. However, the way this book was written felt very distant from the characters. One of the main issues I had with this book and why I didn't really like it all that much was I felt like the queens, the six queens, were made into these victims of Henry VIII's evil reign and Henry VIII himself was a pretty horrible person. The only time we actually see him show, I guess, positive emotions that aren't just like lust uh, are when Jane Seymour dies and she gave birth to Edward. This book set out to tell the real story of these queens. And yet I felt like I understood what happened to them, but I didn't feel like I learned about who they were. Everything we learned about them seemed like in relation to Henry VIII. So we didn't get back a lot of detailed background on their early, early life. I kept comparing this book to The Five, which is the story of the five victims of Jack the Ripper and kind of understanding them because both books kind of take a similar perspective on making you truly sympathize with these women, um, even though their situations were completely different. Like these were queens, those were very impoverished women who were horrifically murdered, so a, a bit different. With that book, The Five, they detailedly went into their upbringing and all the variables that brought them to where they were and tr really tried to understand them. Whereas with this one, each of their stories were just about in the time that they met Henry VIII to the time that they either died or divorced him, depending on the case. That book about The Five did so much better in like portraying these women as real people than this book. So yeah, I ended up giving it two stars. I was not a big fan. The next book I'm going to be reading because I want something, I guess, lighter to read after that. I'm just going to read Windhaven because this is like a pretty light graphic novel. It's pretty short. I am hoping to just like finish it. I probably won't update you halfway in because it's a graphic novel and I don't know, it's pretty short. We will see how I like this and I will check back when I finish it. See ya. Okay, so it is a few days later and I finally finished Windhaven. Um, let me just say I misunderstood what this was. So Lisa Tuttle and George R. R. Martin wrote a novelization, well, the original novel of this book back in the 70s. And this is just an adaptation of that novel that has been transformed into a graphic novel. I had very mixed feelings about this book. I think I'm going to go with two stars. The art is absolutely gorgeous. I was so impressed with the art. Here's the main problem I had with the book. It didn't feel like it had much of a focus. So the book is kind of split into five parts, though three of them are longer. It starts with the main character, Maris, who dreams of being able to fly. So in this world of Windhaven, 
these flyers fly and they take messages from different kingdoms and she has always dreamed of doing that but she is not one of the elite family of flyers so the way this world passes down the wings is through family so for example if you have an oldest son that son is going to inherit your flying wings so she does not have wings but she befriends and kind of is taken into this household of flyers the father intends to give her his wings but then he ends up having a son and so he's like well my son my actual son you know not my really adoptive daughter Mars says adoptive brother uh, decides, you know, he wants to be a singer. He does not, he wants to go around and be like a traveling musician and he does not want to be a flyer. And so she ends up deciding to break down the tradition of flyers saying that wings should be passed to people based on merit and not family. You can definitely see George R. R. Martin, I've heard with Game of Thrones, he pulls on real history. You can definitely see this with this world, uh, where most of the like the political stuff is based on real history. So there's a major classism issue in this book. So the first part is her trying to get her wings. The second part flash forwards to seven years later, and she's working to form this school and train young landmen to be flyers and to gain wings in this competition that is held yearly. The kind of third big part uh, flashes forward 30 years into the future, so she's an older woman now, and she crashes on an island, ends up breaking her legs, hitting her head, and she ends up not having the balance to ever be able to fly again. She is able to make a difference politically, in certain ways. I won't get into all the details of this book. It never feels like there's big stakes because so you have her wanting something and you have, you know, this political climate in the background, but there's no real like thing that the story's working towards. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, there's this big villain that like this world needs to come together and fight. I'm not saying that it needs that, but it just felt like it didn't have that overarching, this is what we're working towards, you know, Lord of the Rings, you have destroying the ring. And I never felt like this had much cohesion. It was just like political climate and Maris's life. And so the last part, the technically fifth part or the last short part is her finally dying. I also feel like a lot of the world was glossed over. And I completely understand why that had to happen because this is a graphic novel and you don't have that much time to get into the world and details because most of the information is told in short blurps or dialogue and you can't really do like long descriptions of the world. Saying that, I looked up the original book that this is based off of and it is over a 100, 400 page book. So, you know, this is less than 200 pages and they're all big pictures with very little dialogue. So I just felt like it probably condensed the world that was in the original novel down way too much. The only reason this book exists is to capitalize on the popularity of George R. R. Martin because it's so much easier to take a book he already wrote and, you know, turn it into a graphic novel and capitalize more on, you know, his popularity now with Game of Thrones. And so I, I just don't feel like this book needs to exist. Even if the art is very pretty, okay, I would not bash the art because it's beautiful. I just feel like there's no reason for this book to exist. Moving on, the next book I'm going to be reading is a Vanguard. I'll, I'll probably check back with you when I've gotten halfway through this book. So I will see you then. Okay, quick update. I've decided to DNF Vanguard. It's not a bad book by any means. I'm not gonna give it a rating on Goodreads or, you know, a full review, just it's not my type of book. Uh, the author I looked up, he was in the Navy. He was a Navy officer for many years and he's retired now. So a lot of this book has to do with military tactics and procedures. And so one, the characters aren't interesting to me at all. And there's a lot of them to try to keep track of. The world isn't interesting enough to keep me going. In this world, it is a human only world universe so far. So they haven't actually found humans. In a lot of sci-fi books, you have them like having contact with aliens, but in this one, they have not found any other sentient 
uh, living organisms in the galaxy as of yet. There's a focus on uh, this colony and there's pirates attacking and then there's other people that are coming to the same area and it's just not that interesting. I just decided, you know what, I'm not gonna force myself to finish this when I'm not enjoying it. I'm just going to DNF it. The next book I'm going to be reading is Silver Stars. Uh, this is the YA novel about these women who fight on the front lines during World War II. And I will be back when I've gotten significantly into Silver Stars. Hopefully I don't wanna DNF that one too. <laughs> I just finished Silver Stars. It gets a one star for me. I did not update you halfway along. I got 50 pages into this book and I was just absolutely hating it. And so I started just like skimming forward. It was an interesting concept premise, but the way it was developed was just horrendous. So it follows these three young women in World War II that worked on the front lines. I mentioned that before. You have Rio, she is African-American. And then you have Rainy, who is uh, Jewish. And and then you have Frangie, who is a white underage girl. What were, what were my beefs about this book? Why did I absolutely not want to read it? The first number one pet peeve I have for historical fiction in general is having it feel too modern. These girls felt like the most modern characters. All of their ideas, uh, their understanding of the world felt entirely modern. Uh, it was like this author took the facts of World War II and were just like, yeah, I'll put like modern understanding of the world and just like throw it into characters. It just didn't make sense. That and, don't get me wrong, like racism, sexism, an issue back then. But the way it is handled in this book is just so blatant. I'm pretty sure like 90% of the men in this book are the most sexist individuals I've ever come across. And it's not even handled subtly. Like if you want to examine the issue with sexism in culture during that time, go ahead. That sounds like an interesting book. But the way this was handled was just like take men down to their most stereotypical sexism. Hey, honey, you look so cute today. And like make that every single male character in the entire novel. That's not saying that all the male characters were bad, but like they were either useless or bad. The female characters just felt very modern, so I couldn't really enjoy any of them. People had very different ideas and a very different upbringing than we do now. The idea that this book purports that all women thought this way and all men thought this way, it's simplifying things so much and it's also putting modern standards and conventions on history and I really dislike that. So I figured the next book I would read, I wanted to read like a light book so I'm going to read The Man Who Invented Christmas even though it's not Christmas, even if it feels weird to be reading this in the middle of June. Yes, it's actually only 200 pages long so because the last section of the book is The Christmas Carol and I'm not going to reread that because I have read that book so many times. I don't need to reread it. So yeah, I will check back with you either after I finish this or when I'm a good way in. Okay, so I just finished The Man Who Invented Christmas. I decided not to give you a halfway update because there's not that much I have to say about this book. I, I really enjoyed this. It, it was good to have a positive reading experience after reading two books that I didn't really like that much. Saying that, this was not exactly how I expected. The movie version of this book has it be more scene plot focused, fictionalized version of how Charles Dickens wrote The Christmas Carol, but this is much more straight up nonfiction. So it talks about a lot of different topics about Dickens. So it talks both about that era, about his ideals and understanding of the issues with poverty, classism, things like that. But also it talks about the tradition of, of Christmas and how they developed both because of the Puritans and over time. And then it also talks about Charles Dickens' publishing history, a little bit how the publication industry worked during that time. It also talks about the background of Dickens in general. For example, his father was majorly in debt, not because he was making like very little money, but because his parents were just very bad at managing money. Literally when he was, I think nine years old, he started working in like a workhouse factory. And you know, by the time he was 31, he was a best-selling author. So I, I really enjoyed this book, uh, especially since it took a lot of information from different biographies that have been written about Charles Dickens. If you are interested in Charles Dickens at all, I've enjoyed pretty much 
every single one of his works that I've ever read. I haven't read all of his works, um, but by far my favorite is probably Little Dorrit, but it's over a thousand pages, I think, so it's definitely a big book to read. But I just love all his books in general. Great Expectations, Christmas Carol, Nicholas Nickleby, Oliver Twist, just all of them are amazing. So I enjoyed learning more of the background, not only of Dickens himself, but the time period he came from. I think I'm going to go ahead and give it four stars. The next book I'm going to be reading is another denser nonfiction, and that is Last Hope Island. And then that means after I finish that book, I will only have the tunnel left so I only have two more books left. I will see you when I have gotten at least halfway into this book. Okay I am back and I just finished Last Hope Island. I decided not to give it a half book update because I didn't have that many thoughts about it and I still don't have a lot of thoughts about it. This was a much denser history book than I was expecting. I would say it almost feels scholarly. An average reader wouldn't get as much out of it as say a scholar who was researching World War II. This book looks at the contributions that different countries played to the Allies effort in World War II. The beginning of the book starts with uh, Norway, Holland, France and Belgium being taken over by Germany. And then it goes on to talk in immense detail. This book is so detailed, uh, but then it glosses over certain things. So it's very particular about what it's detailed about and what it's not detailed about. Then it talks about the attributions that the survivors of the invasion or those who were able to escape to Britain played in helping the war out effort. It does focus on, I would say, a few handful of people but for the most part it is very enormous. It kind of starts in 1938 but I would say it focuses more on 1940 to 1945, pretty much the entire war. I like this book. I'm going to give it three stars just because it was so dense and I felt like there were quite a few times where I felt like the narrative went off topic. It wasn't badly organized, I just thought it could be better and for being like 400 pages this was a pretty dense book. That brings us to the final book I have to read which is The Tunnel. I'm already like 20 pages in. I'm, I'm intrigued so far. I, I haven't got far enough to give you my views so yeah we're almost done so I will check back with you guys when I'm halfway through this book. I am currently halfway done with the tunnel. This is totally different than I was expecting it being. I was expecting it to be more of a wilderness type investigation because you see like abandoned buildings on the front and it almost looks like winter. It doesn't have that feel at all. Uh, but I am enjoying aspects of it even though I don't like other aspects of it. So this follows kind of two men. One is Katz, this uh, Danny Katz, who is this ex druggy criminal who has now reformed his life and works as a translator. His old friend, who also used to sell him drugs, turns up dead of a drug overdose, but Danny doesn't believe it, so he starts investigating his friend's death and trying to figure out where his friend's girlfriend disappeared to. So that's the kind of main story with the actual main character. But on the other hand, you have Jorma. He is a old friend of Danny, who is also a criminal or used to be and he decides to take one more job to make a bunch of money and it is a heist situation. That's how the book begins. That's the first 50 pages or so. The heist does not go well. Either all of his heist partners were captured or uh, one was literally shot through the head by this police officer when they were being chased in the woods and he's the only one that escaped so he's kind of trying to investigate what happened with the heist. Why did it go so terribly and also everyone who is like related to the heist like the inner contact they had in the business that they were stealing from. Uh, he ends up committing suicide by being hung in his apartment. So there's a lot of different elements. So the mystery is what I'm really enjoying. I'm also curious to see how the two plot lines are going to come together because so far it's just been these two different plot lines with Danny investigating his friend's mysterious death and uh, Jorma investigating what happened with the heist. 
and so far they aren't connected, but I'm hoping that they're going to be connected by the end. Here are the elements I'm not enjoying. It's got pretty bad language. They, they swear a lot. There's a lot of like sexual induendo language. I don't like that. So at this point, I think I'm going to give it a three star um, just because I really don't like the language and stuff like that. If it was just based on the mystery, it would probably get at least four to five stars. So far, I am enjoying this one and I will check back with you when I finish this book and then hopefully I will be able to sum up my experiences with reading nine Dollar Tree books. Okay, I am back and I just finished the tunnel. I also got my new glasses. These are from Zini. Tell from this, they're like really reflective so I'm probably gonna take them off. So finished tunnel. I think all my thoughts that I was having early on are exactly what I still feel like. I like the mystery. The way this book deals with tension is very, very good. Uh, the characters were decent enough. I didn't get the whole point of the title being the tunnel until almost like 100 pages near to the ending, but it all made sense in the end why it's titled The Tunnel, though I also feel like the what the tunnel is is the biggest spoiler of the book, so I feel like titling it The Tunnel maybe isn't the best, which leads us to the end of this challenge. Reading nine books in two weeks was a lot. So what is my conclusion to books that you get from the Dollar Tree? First of all, I have to take into the quality of books I got versus their cost. If I found literally one book, that would be worth it because I bought nine books and just getting one book for $9 is still a good deal. Is it worth it to shop at the Dollar Tree? And I guess my conclusion is yes, because you are spending a dollar, but also keep in mind that yes, you're gonna get a relatively new book, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a good Book. I ended up with one DNF, Vanguard. I ended up with one one star, two two stars, three three stars. I have Plagueland, I have Last Hope Island, and I have The Tunnel. And then I have two four stars, The Man Who Invented Christmas and American Girls. Okay, so out of these nine books, what am I going to keep? Uh, I'm honestly only going to keep one book. I thought about it for a while and for me just because I rate something higher like three stars and above even if I enjoyed it that doesn't mean necessarily that I want to reread it. Usually I only keep books that I read and enjoyed that are over four stars so four or five stars. So honestly that limits this selection down to two and for American Girls I honestly just don't feel like I would read it again. It was a fun ride. I still appreciate what it had and I still enjoyed it, but I don't think I'm ever going to read this again. So the only one I'm going to keep is The Man Who Invented Christmas. Out of nine books, that means I found one that I'm going to keep on my bookshelf. So what are my overall thoughts about Dollar Tree? You honestly can't beat one dollar books. So even if I came to the conclusion that all but one of these books was good, it would still be worth it to spend, you know, $9 on that one good book. Maybe you don't find great books there every time, but odds are you're going to find some decent ones. And keep in mind, this is a random selection I took over a random period of time. So I have seen books that I have read and I own and I know I really love. So you know, it's very random what you find at the Dollar Tree. So yes, it's definitely worth looking. So thank you everyone for watching. I know this is a very, very long video and I tried to keep my clips as short as possible. I edited myself down an extreme amount because I tend to just go on and on about books, which I guess is good because that's why we're all here on BookTube is to discuss books. So thank you so much if you've made it this far into the video. If you enjoy this type of content, like, subscribe, comment any thoughts that you have, whether about random books or your experiences shopping at the Dollar Tree for books. I post every Saturday at 6 p.m. and I will see you all in the next video. Bye. Mm -hmm.